welcome to Telston. We are huge fans of yours, and we just want to come out at the beginning and say that right here at the start of the episode. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Big fan. Uh, king. You're a king. Um, what? No, I'm just kidding. We Thank actually you. are. I've been to hundreds of your shows. I can't say that about many people. Uh, I've been to hundreds of your shows. I sound sarcastic, but I can say that with a straight face. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I do look forward to disappointing you all on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no. to happen. We're obviously, we've, you're well vetted. We've looked at a lot. We've been to your shows. We've, I've hugged you. I have a picture with us hugging. So many times, baby. We hugged mm-hmm. and, and uh, we, gen- we connected over a sense of uh, intense alienation. And um... no, I think the connection we make on a deep-seated level is the fact that we don't see comedy the way they portray it. And we mm-hmm. connect with other like-minded individuals. I don't know what you're doing, but I sure know that what you're doing is not what they are doing. So that's good enough for me. Likewise. It's kind of like exactly. I have no idea what you're doing, but as long as it's not what I see. Yeah. Right. Right. A, yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, getting yeah. back to what you were saying earlier about not having any material, and you mentioned kinesiology, uh, which brings me, of course, to, to sports, team sports, and individual sports. So mm-hmm. I always think about how a highly trained and gifted baseball player right before the game mm-hmm. he or she might not know what they're going to do they as they approach the field they don't know what they're going to do out there they they can literally do anything uh but then when it comes to the game and the game starts they just kind of go with the flow right they don't have a set plan they don't come with material but they play ball mm-hmm. if you can enter a flow state you're going to do well if you're yeah, Doc Ellis, that's an inspirational event. And there's a lot more. T- there's other ways to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the objective is, you know, to become effective and efficient and do it effortlessly. Or at least appear to do it effortlessly, which is essentially mm-hmm. the same. You know, but it's to give all that, emit that effortlessness to it. Yeah. It's a way of... Um, Virtue also comes into the equation. No, there's there people people don't say enough about the importance of efficiency in comedy. When you get on stage, you want to create the most explosive laughter possible. LPM with w- most yes, most laughs per minute LPM with minimal effort. You want to be moving right. as little as you can, saying as little as you can. Mm-hmm. Be perfectly still, conserve your energy, mm-hmm. but cause the crowd to kind of uh, change to to react physically and and move around. Erupt like an eruption. Yeah, and the reason why I I deviate from script and I embrace um authentic um I embrace authenticity is because. The, the imperfection is organic. So on one hand, it's, it's an imperfection, and it's kind of organic simultaneously. And I like that space, right? Because you, you're kind of in the moment. It's now. So you know you're, you're experiencing now. So. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's why Jay and I started this podcast, because we wanted to, you know, we we have so many great times together, and then when we're hanging out with our talented friends, we always have these amazing riffs, uh, great, great kind of organic moments that yeah. we, we always wish someone someone was recording that. And you know what's funny like, is they're not we all... wish someone caught it on tape. They're not all comedians. You know what's funny so, is they're not all actually comedians. Not um, all of them. Musicians, um, artists... Mm-hmm. Actor, performers. I mean, there's all kinds of funny people. You don't. Uh, that's been one of the neat things about this podcast is realizing that. And um, please, it's an extension. There's a it's a correspondence. If you look at your performances, it's predicated on a high level of ambiguity. 
uncertainty. And with 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 Jay, it it feels like it's not so much about the ability to evo- evoke laughter in and of itself, although that's part of the equation, but it's more or less the whole the artistic performance aspect of it. The presentation, the creativity, because I've seen times where J- uh, Jay was evoking laughter, and I see times at, at other times where he wasn't, but he was into the performance, he was into the act. And I found that um, intriguing because not too many comedians have the ability to transition from humor into performance art with a high level of um, comfortability. I don't even know if comfortability is a word. So you see, so, and I find that fascinating, which is finding a balance between um, humor and performance art. Well, that's interesting that you say that, because I don't have that many memories of um, not evoking, not getting decent uh, laughter. So that's interesting that you have a memory of that. You see, I've seen you host a lot of shows, too, and a lot of time I host have moments where they evoke laughter and they have moments where uh, they're not. I've had many moments where I didn't evoke laughter as well. Um, but I think I think what it is is if you're, you know, I would say 90% of the time you're evoking laughter and the other 10% of the time you might not necessarily be evoking laughter, but you're evoking something. And it's that feeling of of evoking that that gives you pleasure. So you, you get off on stage on you get off stage even during that ten per, that ten percent when you weren't evoking laughter and you feel good and you you had a great set because you, you evoked something. There's one particular comedian I saw one time and I found to be um comedically fascinating was this comedian had the ability to um to affect the audience with different emotions. Um Kaufman was profound with that. Um, wasn't just about laughter. Was the ability to take the audience in whatever emotional direction you want, whether it's com- the laughter, whether it's suspense, whether it's complete utter silence, whether it's ambiguity, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's paradox. Where what's going on? What is he doing? Mm-hmm. And I find that mind blowing. So not yeah. just the yeah, not just to laughter. Be- Right, the ability to de- if you deviate completely away from laughter and take the audience down the space. I saw Randy Kaufman done that many times. You take the audience down the space. Complete utter silence. Mm-hmm. Then people are angry. People are mad. People are leaving. And I say, wow, this is fascinating because it's taking comedy beyond the laughter. It's a different kind of laughter. And I find it fascinating, the ability to just explore all these, these different variables. When I get on stage, if people laugh, that's great. That's a great byproduct or side effect. But the emotions Mm -hmm. I want people to be experiencing primarily when I'm on stage are envy and resentment. And if people laugh, you know, during that process, that's fine. That's great. More power to them. Uh, I hope they had a great Mm -hmm. date at the show. (laughs) But I I want, uh, yeah. A lot of all those um, performance I did wasn't really centered around evoking and laughter, but was more for shock value. Shock, mm. illicit shock, the kind of, and I find that intriguing because we take in humor in, in like, many different directions. When Salvador Dali came out with a surrealistic art, he was resented by the art community. They say that's not art, that's not this, not no. Now today, in contemporary time, he is seen as a p- profound, and I like that kind of stuff when a person just. Do something different. Do something crazy. Do something I've never seen. Do something unorthodox. Something nonlinear. Something that violates the structure of what comedy is supposed to be perceived as. And I saw Jay. I saw Jay was like one of those people who violated that. You, Matt, you violated that. Uh, there's another comedian. I forgot his name. He kind of violated that. When you get on, when you get on that stage, you take it on your face. Ah, uh, no. What's his name from Long Island? Um, yeah, he did a performance and no one laughed. And in the end, he just destroyed and it was just profound. And he just took it on his face. He couldn't tell if it was comedy, if it was performance art. And I said, man, I like this. Take me in some weird place. I go, what the f- 
walk on my sea in here. But I think, you know, what's interesting is, I hope, Matthew, you were kidding uh, um, about a minute ago when you were talking about um, the concept of shock. I hope you were sho- trying to shock us. When I was talking about how I want to evoke resentment and envy. Yeah, I think that's a. I, uh, I think we're going to have to have a talk about that if that was true because I <laughs> I fundamentally disagree with you on that. Matt, you have the right to say, I hate the fucking girl. And That's he, right. I do. And, yeah, he could get, right. And, he could, and he could get onto a stage and he could curse the living daylight out of this girl. You stink in low life. You pieces of shit. You scumbags. I don't think the crowd is my friend. I resent the crowd. I resent the crowd. No. Because, yeah, you freaking kidding me. I want to go there and insult the crap out of them. You know. Um, Stand up comedy crowd? Yeah, because it's a beautiful situational irony. It's the contrast of what's expected or anticipated. Remember, the audience is expecting you to come out there and make them laugh. And you go out and you say, I'm making you all laugh. You're all a bunch of stinking low life pig shit. Why should I make you all laugh? <laughs> and then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you have a flip. You have a, 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 you have something. You have a strange kind of mixture here, and this becomes that's Matthew Nitch. that's my niche. Yeah. So it could be kind of be whatever you want. You could go out there and hate the crowd. Some people are excited. Some are afraid. If nobody laughs, I hate the audience. I really, legitimately, authentically resent the audience if no one laughs. Times again when I'm super, 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 super afraid. There are times I like them. So I think this is why depression is so high amongst comedians because this emotional fluctuation that's sort of unstable. Jay say it's different. I'm, I was just, just, I wasn't really. Well, I was just taking the uh, devil's advocate side. I but right. I think you're entertaining. Yeah, I think you'd be in the devil advocate. Yeah. No, I don't actually. I think we're all on the same wavelength. That's for sure. And uh, I would say also that you know mental illness and suicidal ideation and this kind of emotional instability that you were attributing to comedians mm-hmm. is also very present among stand-up comedy audiences. The kind of people who go see stand-up comedy, uh, they're often not doing too great. In my experience. Why? Because they don't possess the ability to self therapy. We have we, our the right. gift is self therapy and everything. They need that. So when you go there and you start insulting them or you start resenting them, they they laugh. Mm-hmm. How could this because guy they can't they us? can't do it themselves. If they could do it themselves, they wouldn't go to a show. Yeah. I mean they can do it at, why, they can watch T V and then yeah, sometimes they get restless, they'll go out to a club. Yeah, well, live humor is, a, is is as extraordinary as it gets. Mm-hmm. You know, the performance is raw, the laughter is raw, the experience is raw, the laugh is raw, in the moment. I think it might be interesting to talk about how we feel like a lot of comedians, like, you know, some of the funniest people in the world, like, I don't know, Ricky Gervais or whatever, they are... Um, they feel alienated by society, but then in the world of comedy, they feel um, at home. But then the sense of alienation you were describing, I think we can all relate to. It's like my first um, sociological or psychological observation. That is, um, again, it's an irony. I call it the eccentric irony, where comedians are pervasive for being eccentric. So you would assume that a comedic environment, you know, that sort of interpersonal communication, you as an eccentric comedian would find a safe haven, assuming you encounter in like-minded individuals like, like yourself. But then what you discover is, um, psychologically and sociologically, that eccentricity has like a baseline. There's a level of exced, ex centricity amongst comedian that's considered considered socially acceptable uh, amongst comedians and anything that's above that you come like you come like an outcast so it's like you end up in a vicious cycle 
where you meet an eccentric people, but you are just too eccentric for the eccentrics. It's like you're like a, you're like a hyper eccentric person. So you see where some comedians where if they were too eccentric, they were they were isolated, and then you have a, a group of eccentric comedians who would interact and have a conversation, but all of them collectively. Yeah, eccentricity was to a level that was considered socially acceptable. And I found myself in that space because I realized, man, I'm just too weird, man. I'm, I'm perceived as strange or odd. And it wasn't because I was weird, because I think I was in a different space mentally. And it's just difficult to find others to connect to the space you're in sometimes. And I think the reason that Matthew, Jay, Travis, uh, um, Douglas, you all sort of magnetically was magnetically drawn to each other was because in some psychologically disparate way you all share a common denominator across the board when it comes to comedy um, in three categories you all have a sort of a kind of authenticity a kind of um, ingeniousness and a kind of innovation that you all bring to comedy um, in your individuality. And I think these are the three qualities that sort of brought you all together. All those, these three qualities has its different variances to it. You all share this thing across the board that, you know, we unique, we different. And this is what brought you all together. You all didn't sound like that, but that, that stereotypical carbon copy IBM um, comedian. I call him the IBM. IBM? I call him IBM comedian. IBM comedian is where is different vessels carrying the same product. Hmm. Uh, different ships, same product. They all sound, they look different, but they sound the same. And so when you find others who have a sort of individuality, just a sense of self, this is what I like. This is what I want to do. I don't like, care what, what, this, what this field say, what this discipline say. This is what my heart, my, my mind, and my soul is gravitating towards. And you, you, you think we all kind of gravitate towards each other because we're all in that same kind of space. You know? We're like the Apple or Mac brand. I say the X-Men of these insignificant mortals. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Edit that. Like X Men. No, we're, we're not editing that out. We're gonna leave everything related to X Men, and actually, we're gonna make it louder. We like things like that. We like <laughs> Superman. We like talking about Batman, um, Spider Man. What else? Uh, what is, there's others. No, I have a strange feeling that this podcast is going to... You're all going to extend this podcast? Because this is going to be at least two hours long. It's going to be two hours. At oh. least. We probably should wrap up, but if, if you guys have a second, I do have an old Ricky Gervais joke that I can tell. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so, this was in the days past there was a train conductor and mm -hmm. he, he, he grew up always wanting to conduct trains all his life and finally managed to become one in his late twenties. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he went to his job every day. He, he conducted the train and one day he drove the train into a crowd of people killing several of them. And, of course, you know, he lost his job. He went to uh, the court, and the judge sent sentenced him to five years in prison. Five years later, he gets out of prison, gets another job as a train conductor, does his job, goes to his job, enjoys his job, and then one day, again, runs over three people using his train. Mm -hmm. Goes to court. The judge says... Look, this is your this is your second time doing this. This is really messed up. You're going to get ten years in prison. Mm -hmm. Goes to prison for ten years. Ten years later, he gets out of prison, gets another job as a train conductor, mm -hmm. which was his his passion all his life. Does his job, goes to his job, drives the train, 
Then again, some sort of horrible event happens, and he, he runs over some people. This time, he goes to court, and the judge says, okay, this is, this is really kind of heinous at this point. Mm. Uh, and the judge gives him the, the death sentence. So this conductor is, he's sitting in the electric chair, and they ask him if he wants any final meal, and he's, he's fine, he doesn't want anything. And they, they pull the switch, and the electricity comes on in the chair, and five minutes later, they turn off the switch, and the guy stands up out of the chair, exits the room, and gets yet another job as a train conductor. And they ask him, what happened? Why, why didn't you die in the electric chair? Mm-hmm. And he says, well, I'm a bad conductor. <laughs> <laughs> you owe that joke, Matthew? It's an old Ricky Gervais Ricky. joke. He, oh. You take no credit for that. None. Well, you have to take credit for giving a joke. I'll take credit for the delivery. <laughs> I have some Ricky Gervais jokes. Do you really? Yep. Let's hear them. Uh, here are... Um, well, uh, here's an introduction. Since entering the public spotlight as David Brent in 2001... Ricky Gervais has made plenty of enemies with his caustic wit, but plenty of fans too. And now here are his um, 45 of his best cringe-inducing jokes from previous shows and appearances and The Office. Uh, This is one that says, Mondays are fine, it's your life that sucks. Damn. That is something Ricky Gervais said. Right, and that's cool too because that's that's interesting. It sort of plays with the structure, traditional structure of jokes. The punchline comes last, or the punchline comes first. Uh, there's a lot more of these actually. Do commandos not wear pants? They must wear pants, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a good amount of these, actually. I don't know how many you like. I don't know how much both of you like Ricky. I like to hear three Ricky jokes, usually. But Telson, do you have any... It, it, you, you don't have to tell your jokes. You can tell someone else's. One of uh, the greats, even. Do you know any Ricky um, or others similar? Mm-hmm. I know... Um, so I'm half black and I'm half Jewish. Whenever I go to a restaurant, I don't tip twice. <laughs> <It's a joke. laughs> I like that one. I've heard that Tonight. before from you. I have to admit. You have heard to admit it. the mic. The mic joke is a classic. Yes, that's the one the I always think of. It's yeah. hard to do that joke in a, in a podcast context. I know, I know. No, it's official. Open mic. I see the disadvantage with this joke is it takes ten seconds to give it, but twenty five seconds to close it and I go sorry microphone but you are being screwed <laughs> <laughs> as you're screwing the microphone back in right yeah and then, and then I held the cable up and I say man I'm watching cable yeah and I'm watching my favorite show too The Wire and how I know it's, <laughs> yeah, and how do I know it's The Wire because it's cast black yo <laughs> yo <laughs> and, then I, and then I say can I then I pick up the whole stand I say can I take this home tonight yeah I want to have a one night stand and then I remember uh, yeah. dropping the stand on the stage and I said, man, stand, I'm a police officer, stand oh. down. Dude, those jokes were so profound. I don't even know how I came up with those jokes, man. And the way I came up with those jokes, it was precise, exact, and relevant. And there's a sort of, you know, brilliance to it because I structured so much material in the now. It got to a point where I could go on stage and I already have a, 45 minutes material. I said, okay, we got a microphone. We got the red carpet. And there's another scene where, you know, in a lot of these open mics, so they had these big, gigantic um, television screens, right? But listen to this. They had the, this big screen. And I remember saying that, um, you know, all of the television off, technically it's on because I feel like I'm watching Grey's Anatomy. 
right. Yeah. And then I would see a speaker on stage. And I said, wow, this is a very tall speaker. I wonder what it plays. Basketball. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. So, and the more those <laughs> spontaneous comedy I did, it got to a point where I'll go to a place, right? And I'll scan a room like Terminator or the Predator. And I say, okay, I got this, I got this, I got this. And so now I walk into a room and I already know I have half an hour material. Well, and I won't use that material. Under no circumstances, I would use that material. So I have half an hour material lined up. You know, like, remember MacGyver? Mm-hmm. MacGyver, you know, although ironically, he had all these um, props set up in place to facilitate his, um, his scientific needs. You know, I kind of created that atmosphere, this, that ambience. And although I'd have 20 minutes material, I won't use it. I say under no circumstances. This is back up if you get stuck. And then I would focus on coming up with something new. And then, so I would always be build and build and build and build and build. Got to a point where I could go to a show and I'd say, okay, a show needs a stage. A show needs a, it's most likely going to have a projector. Most likely going to have a, a mic. Gonna, so there's things I, I had set in place where I know I just couldn't fail. And then I'll just improvise and look for more and look for more and look for more. If I, if I got stuck, then I'll pull something out of the hat. And I found that profound. You know? Yes. That was great. I loved when I loved watching you get in the flow, just based in your environment. You saw yeah. what was in front of you and around you, and you just mm-hmm. got in the zone. And I saw that many times uh, with different decorations, items that would be on stage. You would interact with. It was I loved it. And people thought I was. People still think I'm acting. People always told me, "Oh, you acting?" I said, "I'm not really acting. I mean, I'm not acting." I mean, I'm multidimensional. I'm not acting. I'm, right. I'm, I'm intelligent. I mean, I'm an educated person, but I'm not necessarily acting. I'm, yeah, I'm really, really. And I think that's kind of, I think I had a little resentment because some people will go on stage and they try so hard, man. <laughs> I used to feel bad because they sit there and they'll, they'll write their stuff. And I say, oh my God, I'm going to go on stage and kill. And that person's going to hate me because I ain't doing shit. <laughs> Uh-huh. That's funny, man. <laughs> you know, you are a huge inspiration to to, to both of us. Definitely. I must say that I am flabbergasted beyond comprehension. I sound like one of those British imperialists. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> man, I feel like this was one shitty podcast, man. Oh, that was great. It was oh. incredible. <laughs> the people are going to love it. Peace, y'all. What made you all invite me? I mean, you all had so many options. Oh, we so booked a lot of other people, too. But, but we also wanted you around. We liked what you, yes. your energy, and we liked you brought, you made a lot of people laugh. What else do you want? Oh, that's such a poor choice. I'm so disappointed in, in the, your, your, the decisions you all made. You know, <laughs> now possible. you're being self-deprecating. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm taking advantage of the opportunity. Sure. You, you gotta to see, seize your chance. You want this podcast to succeed? I'm the last person you invite. <laughs> I disagree. So this, is, this is gonna be our highest grossing episode. You think so? Yeah. Do I have permission to um I'm probably gonna use snippets of this clip and upload on my social media. Definitely. Yeah, once uh once it's um well, we're gonna we'll we'll edit it and then we'll send it to you and then you can use that. It'll sound really good. So, so don't use don't use my version of it. No, I mean it'll sound better. It'll sound better when we we'll send you like a clean, uh, polished for hours version that you like. Hello, any anything to plug, Atelston before you go? Man, man, you can visit my website, atelstone.com. That's A as in Apple, T as in Tom, E as in Egg, L as in Larry, S as in Sam, T as in Tom, O as in Onion, and as in Nancy. Atelstone.com, research scientist, lecturer, a bunch of stuff. Go to my site, see my work. Um, consultation, I charge $25,000 an hour. I'm not cheap. Ooh. Um, I was just joking, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Just joking. I hear you. 
Well, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Everyone should go to atelston.com. Uh, Matthew, I hope you're, everything's okay. I'll be fine. All right. Uh, that's good. Atelston, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. It's been incredible just hearing your voice after mm-hmm. many years of, I hadn't heard it in a while live. That, this is awesome. Peace, Peace y'all. y'all.